Okay, kids, it's time for a secret cartoon. The 1990s were chock full of action cartoons. Great heights and low lows. Mm. Definitely new and improved metalheads. But out of all of them, I haven't found many that weren't rightfully forgotten. I mean, I already touched on Road Rovers and the cavalcade of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle clones, which for some reason is one of my most popular videos, but I think that doesn't cover it well enough, as there were also more broadly a lot of toy vehicles that failed because of one thing or another. Then there was the first wave of anime that crept their way over to the American market. I had no idea the real age. Then there's like Disney stuff. But besides all those, there is one strange little show that I don't think has been remembered as well as it should be. Okay, so this is where I originally wanted to play the cyber intro of Cyber 6 as a look how cool this is thing, but it fell victim to YouTube's shitty detection bot and would have blocked the entire video with multiple fucking claims. So just look this bitch up yourself. You deserve it. It's a banger. Anyway... Cyber 6 is a 1999 animated series based on a Spanish language comic that was created in 1991 by Carlos Meglia together with Carlos Trillo for the Italian magazine Scorpio, a magazine attracting and initially entirely devoted to Argentine artists when it was founded back in the 70s. Though sadly not much of any of the artists other works, the comic or the magazine seem to have been translated into English which is a darn shame since it all looks very impressive. Which is the downside to all of this, but the upside is that this Italian-Argentine connection really does provide a very unique visual for the setting of the comic and the show. With the setting of Cyber 6 being the city of Meridiana, which has Italian cars, football, a Mediterranean look, but also tall buildings, jaguars, jungles, escaped Nazis conducting experiments deep in the jungle a la Yusuf Mengele, you know, the stuff you'd expect from this kind of fusion. Gentlemen, we are Nazis. Bro, this nigga be looking like Chad Tronic. And in this setting, the series centers around the exploits of the titular Cyber 6. In the comic, one of 5,000 Cybers who basically went through the events of Detroit Become Human before the events of the story. Oh my god initially being created as emotionless servants by and for Dr. von Reichter. Get it? His name is like Richter, but with Reich. Uh... See you at the cool party, Richter! But then they got self-aware, turned on him, and now after some time he has come back out of hiding from the repercussions of his evil deeds. For the second time, I guess. Feiglinge! Von Reich and Versager! The Doctor has also brought with him this army of Frankensteinian dudes called Fixed Ideas. No, I don't know what is up with the names on this show either. As well as his clone son, Jose. Jose? Yes, father. Jose. Who does this little goose step, wears something that looks like an HJ uniform. Jonathan Josta. And has the same name that Josef Mengele registered himself under when he fled from Argentina to Paraguay after the Mossad started picking up on his trail. So yeah, if you thought I was just being me again, imagining another Nazi connection, <laughs> no. In the comic, Jose also rapes women, just in case the Nazi thing wasn't enough for you. But luckily enough, we have Cyber 6 to uncover and foil Dr. von Reichter's schemes while managing her day job posing as male teacher Adrian Seidelman. Though the actual animated series does tone down a lot of the more questionable shit. So no nudes, no sex, no draining the vital fluid that all of Dr. von Reichter's creations need to survive from the mix of the grey dudes. In a way, it's kind of shocking how much of the character of the property changes with the show taking out a lot of the edgy early 90s, clearly not mainstream comic stuff. That while pointless a lot of the times, is pretty entertaining to people like me. But that begs the question, if they nutted or gooted so much of the original source material's bread and nutter, what are we left with in the end? The short version is... This show didn't have enough time to figure it out, seeing as it only had 13 episodes. And it's clear that it wasn't enough time to really put everything together and make sense of the stuff they had built up. 
And what really compounds that issue is its choice of genres. Seeing as it does actually have some soap elements to it, perhaps not surprising given its heritage, it also has action, it has comedy. But none of these elements really come together in a way to make everything feel satisfying. At least not in a consistent way throughout the entire show. The first and last episodes are great, like the beginning of a journey, and there are some good ones in between, but you really lack that connectivity between all the elements to make it feel cohesive. And believe me, this next bit is a bit hard to visualize and to keep from being too dry, as it is a bit theoretical, so bear with me. For a show in general, you need to put down protagonists, antagonists, tone, setting, and plot. In comics, especially action comics, which I think Cyber 6, the comic, mostly falls into, you can mostly get away with just leading by tone with a strong protagonist to carry it, without necessarily having to worry about characterization that much. Think Superman. But this doesn't apply as strongly in animation, where getting a tone right is so much more tricky as you need the looks, the aesthetic, the illusion of physicality, and the writing depth to make something good, seeing as in this medium genre elements just tend to blend. Now of course again there are exceptions, for instance when the Man of Steel initially hit screens in animation back in the 40s, this amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the Man of Steel, Superman! There they really did exploit the inherent animatability of Superman's powers, and the look still makes it hold up today incredibly well. And you may say the same thing for this show, that the animatability of the heroine and this show's looks does make it still hold up. And to a degree that's true. But let's also keep in mind that even though I think just visually the amount of coolness on screen is comparable to those old shorts, that's exactly what they are. Short, snappy, and created for a different format than long-form television. And I think therein lies the problem I have with this show. Here we have a television series that has to run double the length. And it really shows that what they have come up with doesn't really fit a TV series long term. Seeing as the main bad guy can't or doesn't do anything. In a word, nothing. And the character that was just haha, what if we had this kid acting like a perverted grown up, has been slightly rewritten and given a bigger role. Now, in principle, messing with the formula like this isn't necessarily bad and can be rewarding in certain instances. But let's not forget that even with adjustments and reworks, the Cyber 6 comics, which were primarily about spectacle, aka what kind of weird and crazy shit can we put on the page now, only have so much material to give on their own. And in my mind, spectacle can only get you so far. Which I suspect is why the Superman shorts worked so well. One of villains with cool, visually impressive plans done and dusted with an under 10 minutes. But in 22 minute TV land, Cyber 6 has the task of trying to fill the air, but clearly not the means of doing so yet. And with the overall show being cut short after only one season, not really helping the issue. And here are some things that stuck out the most to me as suffering from this. The dynamic with von Reichter and Jose feels arbitrary and terrible, both clearly have their own agendas and different ways of doing things, but they're forced to stay together so that neither stands out. In fact, throughout the show, von Reichter has so little things to do that he's mostly just used to explain why weird, unnatural elements are actually in the world of Cyber 6, and that's just lazy. Where did you come from? Von Richter. I was sent to find and destroy you. <sighs> Keep in mind that this is episode 10, a couple episodes after she's already battled a giant bird man, goblin gargoyles, and a terraria boss, plus a couple more, all of which she knew were related to Jose, the fixed ideas, and therefore von Reichter. So why this is a shock to her as anybody's guess. Maybe because it's a threat aimed directly at her this time? But at this point you really shouldn't be surprised that this happens after dismantling the agendas of a resident evil villain this many times. Can you tell that I really enjoyed Resident Evil 8? 
And in the third and second to last episodes, we actually do get some new original villains acting fully independently, including Dommy Werewolf Mommy, which has about as much of an air of danger about her as Lady Demetresque, but about as much screen time also. So we finally meet. <laughs> Give her two lips like roses and clover And tell me that my lonesome nights are over When I brought that up to Daniel, my close friend, it's game time, artist, and the guy with whom I do the panthcasts with, but isn't that to create ASMR for your, like, degenerate audience, nigga? He asked me if this show might have fared better had it come out about five to seven years later, as that was when a lot of series like Avatar had already concluded. And I would say yes, because shows like that already would have provided a blueprint for this one, how to juggle humor, action, and a bit of drama with, you know, a slice of the fantastical. All these elements are so underdeveloped here because they have to share space with everything else. And since now serialization is common as fucking dirt in animated shows, it might be harder for audiences to look at this show, which just kind of lives as a weird little mutant of a proto-serialized show and a Monster of the Week cartoon. For me it is certainly difficult, as I can't really think about anything but how much potential there is, since it's a really unique setting and at the same time there's just so much left on the table. At the beginning, you really get the feeling that it's the beginning of a journey, with us gathering friends along the way. Here in episode 4, which is incidentally based on the first issue of the comic, albeit with von Reich that switched out with Jose, which I think is a courageous decision, to say the least given how little we actually see von Reich that do actively during the show, we see them go to a nerdy detective, who has a slight hint of author self-insert about him, call it a hunch based on all the disgusting nerd merch he has in the comic, Night. who is informed that the fixed ladies have kidnapped his little sister and he is now forced to track down Cyber 6. He finds out Cyber 6's secret identity, and then there's a big fight with a snail thing, Jose commits a cinema sin, YOU THINK IT'S OVER CYBER 6? IT'S JUST THE BEGINNING! This isn't the end, this is just the beginning cliche. And Cyber 6 and the detective make up, ending up with him promising that he will keep quiet about her double life, which is cool as they do make you feel as if that means something. But for all intents and purposes, that's basically it, as we never see him again and their relationship basically ends there. Which I think is a missed opportunity because, you know, as previously established, Cyber 6 isn't a very detective-y character. <clears throat> and I feel the same with Werewolf Lady from before. I think both she and the detective are two sides of the same coin, with both of their plots revolving around going deep into the heroine's life, and in contrast to the detective, albeit unwittingly, meddling with the people Cyber 6 cares about. In this case, her alter ego's friend and Cyber 6's love interest, Lucas. No, it's not that. Look, I wasn't expecting you. I have company on the way over. Oh, so that's your excuse for being rude. No, no. If, if you were here, it would be uncomfortable. And th that's all. Look, I'm just worried about you. You just seem to be acting. You have nothing to worry about. I'm fine, okay? Now, do you mind? Mind leaving? Thanks ever so much, Lucas. Damn, Lucas, that is cold. Part of the man code is always bros before hoes. Even if they are werewolves. Wait a minute, I wanna rewind that. Yeah, if you're a smart cookie, you might have raised an eyebrow at the phrase her alter ego's friend and Cyber Six's love interest. And that's another point that they really never address, despite how obnoxiously smug the 90s could be, with how progressive they are. A girl? Welcome to the 90s. Admit it, darling. You didn't think two women were capable of bringing you down. Are you born with a knife super glued onto your hand or what? For God's sake, Chucky, drag yourself into the 90s. Stabbings went out with Bundy and Dahmer. You look like Martha Stewart. Who the fuck is Martha Stewart? My idol. That whole 2010s gender, trans world airlines, LGBTQ, cuckoo clock, SDKFZ, 234, AA. <laughs> Last thing is something that wasn't on anybody's mind back then. Back then you were either gay, a crossdresser or not, and nobody gave a shit if you did a huge Colgate rant. But as a result, the actually interesting part about this show, the whole question about which is the real person here, test cube creation cyber six, 
or the self-forged identity of Adrian Zeidelman basically gets ignored. Which is a shame since both Burton and Batman Tass explored the whole concept of self-identity really well in relation to superheroes. For that look of the episode, perchance the dream, it's really good. It's like I'm living someone else's life. I don't know anything about me anymore. Help me, Leslie. Your unconscious created a life more satisfying to you. Once you find pride in your own existence, then these delusions will vanish. And all these years of training and discipline. What happened to my parents? A delusion. But yeah, overall, this is less Selena Kyle Catwoman. I don't know about you, Miss Kitty, but I feel so much yummier. And more Clark Kent. This is a job for Superman. I mean, look, they even included the whole leaping thing. You don't see anything moving in a comic book. Somebody can leap and it sounds great. It sounds like he's, oh, look, listen. But he's leaping, like, and it looks ridiculous. It looks really stupid. But yeah, to tie it all together, this isn't me trying to list off stuff to make you not watch it. I just think that there's a lot of stuff left on the table and it causes chagrin for me. But still, I don't want to be one of those assholes that only talk about shit they don't like or at least are incredibly unfair to in order to make themselves feel superior. You know the one that I'm talking about. It's what me, is it? the Lightbringer! We open with the DreamWorks logo of that kid in the moon fishing. There is no bait on that hook. Does he actually plan on catching anything or does he just enjoy holding a stick? Bruh. Why the fuck do you channel awesome people think this is actual criticism? Fuck off. At the end of the day, I like this show. I like the pulpy overtones. I like that it at least toys with cool concepts, even if they are a bit too big for its britches. Because for every big concept it doesn't do much with, it has those small moments that will at least surprise you. From the one where the girl that has a crush on Adrian calls Cyber Six a bimbo. Cute outfit. Bimbo. <laughs> To the final episode that involves a giant enemy crab that's a giant living bomb because Killer Queen touched it. This show overall is a really good time and I think you should give it a go. If nothing else, at least for the aforementioned animation quality. It's stunning, it's dynamic, and it's a joy to see Cyber 6 letting her acrobatic skills rip. The action scenes are good, it overall features awesome cinematography and art that captures the comic incredibly well and just looks good on its own. If you really want to see what the show looks like upscaled and not in total garbo vision, look at these clips from the version available on Amazon Prime, which is the only viable way of watching it instead of pirating it like I did or paying 60 bucks for the DVD box set. Which over here isn't available anymore and Amazon also tells me the availability of it on Prime outside of the US is limited also, so... I mean, I'm not saying that someone who can watch this show as crisp as it is here should screen record it and put those files into a folder and quietly drop that onto the pirate bay, but... As this show is basically legacy content at this point, since it's been 22 years, with both of the creators Carlos Trillo and Meglia having died about a decade ago, there's no way in hell we'll ever see this comeback, as far as I can see. That is kind of why I wanted to review this show. If you yourself end up writing, drawing, or animating something inspired by it, even if it's years down the line, then I consider my mission fulfilled. Since it's just... stuck there now. Lost in space. Oof. This was... This was a little project I had in the back of my mind that I've wanted to do since the beginning of March. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for getting videos out. Like, not only like one every two months or one is every month. It's just... Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, well. I'm trying to get better. And if you want me to be motivated to make more videos and make videos more often, be actually sure to subscribe because... Because I'm fucking chasing those numbers, bruv. I'm chasing those numbers. Oh, have a nice day. Have a nice day, everyone.
That's right. Because you know, deep down, you deserve to be punished. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Sadomasochism. Oh yeah.